Hey everyone, I hope you're well. This is the story about what if Naruto could manipulate shadows. Before we start, please subscribe to the channel and like the video as well. So without any further ado, let's start the what if. Naruto's home. Naruto went home after beating the hell out of the Uchiha. He didn't really have much planned beyond that. He was more or less waiting out the clock until the Chunin exams. After that was when things would get really fun. For once, he actually wasn't glomped by Perona immediately after walking in the door. Finding this odd, he searched around the house for her, if she wasn't trying to get as close to him as possible, something was probably wrong. Or not, he found her in his bedroom, fast asleep. He knew that he had no shot in hell of waking her up, so he just left. He had that latest soldier model to complete after all. The only question that was really plaguing his mind was, where the hell did she get a plushie of me? I've only seen Niji and Sasuke plushies like that one before now and those were made by, oh no. Fuck, if that thing were of the same design, that means I've, gulp, I've got fangirls. Fuck. Ninja Academy. The students weren't really reacting that well to Sasuke getting the shit kicked out of him. The guys, with the exception of Shino and Shikamaru, laughed at the Uchiha's misfortune. The girls, with the exception of Tenten and Hinata, all cried that his opponent cheated, otherwise he never would have beaten their Sasuke-kun. Sasuke himself was fucking pissed. I'm an Uchiha, I'm the best. How could I possibly lose against some commoner like that? Oh well, it doesn't really matter. Once I get a real sensei and my Sharingan, I'll beat the hell out of that hat-wearing weirdo, and after that I'll kill Itachi. The Sharingan is invincible, I'll copy his jutsu and he won't stand a chance. After all, the only one who could possibly stand a chance against an Uchiha is another Uchiha. Sasuke's mental ravings aside, Sakura was asking Tenten a rather interesting question. Hey, Tenten you said you know that guy? What's his secret? How could he have beat Sasuke-kun? He cheated somehow, but what's his trick? Tenten looked at her and smirked a bit, it's nothing major, he has complete control over darkness. It will rise to defend him against any kind of attack without him having to lift a finger, or do anything. You could attack him from total ambush and you wouldn't get close to him. I told you already, Sasuke doesn't stand a chance against him, and from what I saw of his abilities when he fought Guy, no one really does. Not alone, at least. Sakura looked enraged and shouted, what, you think he's the strongest in the world or something? Tenten closed her eyes and sighed, it's not that Sakura, he's nowhere near being the strongest in the world, it's just his techniques and strategy. His unique abilities and the way he uses them make it almost impossible for a single person to win. You need at least two people to have a real chance. Sakura looked puzzled and curious, what do you mean? What are his techniques? Images of battle flashed into the brunette's mind. The images of a man clad in green spandex running from tendrils of darkness and creatures made of nothing but darkness, and Tenten running for her life as the entire forest around her was crushed by seemingly nothing as it sank into the ground covered in darkness resembling heatless black flames so black that it could be mistaken for a hole in the ground which spread all across the training ground from its epicenter, Naruto, who was coated in an aura of shadow as more darkness emanated from his body, expanding around him and rising into the sky like a column of black smoke. Sorry Sakura, it's hard to explain. For you to understand, you would have to see him fight for real. It's just something that you have to see yourself to really grasp. Now, if you'll excuse me. Ten Ten got up and left, the exams were almost over so the two senseis didn't mind. She didn't like talking about that day too much, the techniques she saw that day, the possibilities they posed, and the sheer malice and confidence with which they were used still terrified the girl, so she just left Sakura there in confusion. Team Guys, Training Ground It had been one week since Naruto kicked Sasuke's ass and things were doing good. The final three Genin teams had been decided. They were teams 7, 8, and 10. Consisting of Sasuke, Sakura, and Tenten, Kiba, Hinata, and Shino, and Ino, Shoji, and Shikamaru respectively. 
Ten Ten was pissed when she got the same Jonin Sensei twice, especially after seeing how easy the test was compared to the first one she got from him. Something just told her and Naruto that the only reason that team passed was because the Uchiha was on the squad. Not that there was any proof of that of course, but it was pretty strange how they were the first team in Kakashi's history to get a passable examination. The poor bastards had been stuck doing D-rank missions and non-stop for a week and judging by how things normally work they would be doing it until the Chunin exams were here. By that time, they would probably get to do a C-rank. Naruto knew that D-ranks were fucking irritating, and that was why he joined in. Naruto regularly disguised himself and hired ninja for D-rank missions, always coming up for the most disgusting and horrible stuff for them to do that he could imagine. He also kept setting the daimyo's wife's cat free, forcing the fat broad to hire ninja to catch the little monstrosity. Mind you the thing really liked him, setting it free about 20 times gets you on someone's good side, I guess. But more important was that his calculations on the likelihood of a C-rank were wrong. He heard just today that Team 7, Sasuke's team led by Hadake Kakashi, was heading out of the village on a C-rank. Normally this wouldn't bother him much, what was concerning him was the fact that it was Tanami no Kuni and the client of the mission, Tazuna. He knew of Tazuna's efforts to build a bridge connecting Nami no Kuni and Hai no Kuni in order to break Gata's monopoly, and that wasn't something he wanted. If Gatu is threatened, he'll bring out the zombie squad that he sold the businessmen. They were good but their bodies were older models so someone like Kakashi might be able to beat them. If that happened then the whole zombie business would be put under a fucking microscope and that was something that he couldn't let happen. So Naruto devised a plan to get to Nami no Kuni before the zombies were brought out and monitor the situation. With any luck Gatu would hire a nuke strong enough to take down Kakashi and nip the problem in the bud, but there was a possibility that that plan wouldn't work and Kakashi would go up against his undead. If that happened he would just destroy the zombies, it wouldn't be too hard, but it wouldn't change the fact that Kakashi saw them and if he reported what he saw, which he would, investigations would be launched. So Naruto would go to Nami no Kuni for a week or so and finally tie up loose ends with Gatu. If he had some spare time, he might even be able to get the replacement weapon that he had in mind. The situation could get really bad if he was found, so it would have to be a stealth mission. After training, Naruto packed a bag and prepared for his temporary escape. Since Guy knew that his shadow didn't have a shadow, and neither did he when they were separated, he couldn't use the trick that he did with the Sand Aime four years ago. He would have to rely on Atsuchi Bunshin instead. The trouble was that the clone didn't have his abilities with shadows. The clone would call in sick and lie in bed for a week while he left the country for a little while. When he got back it would be almost time for the Chunin exams so it worked out. He would have to get there first but thanks to the Kage Hoku that would be no problem at all. He had prepared everything he needed and was about to leave when Perona showed up. So Naruto, heading off to Nami no Kuni already? He just looked at the ghost girl in a bit of surprise, yes, um, how did you know that? Perona looked at him, smiled and said, I know a lot more than most people give me credit for. My ghosts can hear you know. So let's get going. What? He didn't really intend to take Perona with him. Sure, he had been teaching her the ninja basics, but he had no specific need for her particular skills. Perona looked at him and said, I want to go too, ever since we got here I've left the house fewer than five times. I need to get outside, plus I don't want to stay too far away from you Naruto Kuen. She smiled as she said that last sentence. Naruto sighed, he knew that once she had her mind set on something, it would be hard as hell to talk her out of it, and you never really know when her techniques would come in handy, so he assented. Perona cheered and Naruto grabbed her shoulder before vanishing from the house. Nami no Kuni, Naruto's camp. Naruto had watched as the newly formed Team 7 entered the country. It wasn't long after that before they were attacked by Momochi Zabuza, a member of the Seven Swordsmen. He would have been killed by Kakashi if he didn't have an accomplice waiting in the wings to save him. At the same time, Kakashi was extremely drained of chakra during the fight. To be honest, Naruto was more than a little disappointed in the Cycloptic Jonin. 
He was famed and revered for being one of the most powerful jonin of Kanoha, and yet he is out of commission for a week after a single fight when he barely took any injuries. Sure, he knew a lot of ninjutsu, but that was because of the Sharingan. Hell, he was known as Kapi Ninja Kakashi. The only reason he was famous was because of his ill-gotten Sharingan eye. If his teammate Abito never died, he wouldn't even have a bingo book entry, hell it was possible that he wouldn't even be a jonin. It didn't help Naruto's opinion of him that Kakashi was one of the foremost Kyuubi haters, he longed for the day that Kakashi was stupid enough to try and take him out. Still, Zabuza was out of action for a week and Kakashi was out for about as long. Zabuza and his unnamed accomplice caught Naruto's interest. Since Zabuza was here, he could easily attain his body if he died same goes with the apprentice. He could have the original frames for two new general zombies by the end of this mission, three if Kakashi died. Mind you, he really wanted to get some information out of Kakashi regarding his father's sword, the Chakra Fawn. After all, it was only right for Hadake Sukumo to wield the sword he wielded in life, was it not? While Hadake Kakashi was a poor example of a ninja, his father was a totally different matter. All he needed was a powerful shadow for that particular corpse. Alas, he had a week to kill before Zabuza made his entrance again. Under normal circumstances he would have to sit there bored, but in this case he had another goal, the attainment of the perfect weapon. As he prepped to leave, Perona asked him, I thought you didn't fight close range. Why do you need a weapon anyway? He looked at the girl and smiled, you never know when something may come in handy Perona-chan. I am actually well versed in Kenjutsu, I just need a powerful sword to wield. Through Yukino-chan's abilities, I have managed to locate a very powerful sword, the most powerful sword ever made. Perona asked him, really, where is it? What's its name? Naruto looked toward the sea and said, in all of history, there have been 21 swords of immense power. These swords were made by an unknown master at an unknown time, but it is guaranteed to be over a thousand years ago. These swords were of unsurpassed quality and have been featured in many legends. Excalibur was one such blade. These swords have passed through time, unblemished for most of it. However, these swords have been, for the most part, destroyed. It is unknown how it was done, but most of them were collected and erased from existence. He took a breath before continuing, replacements have been attempted, such as the Kusanagi no Tsuruji, the Raijin Sword, the Chakra Fong of the Hadake clan, the swords wielded by the seven swordsmen such as Zengetsu or Samahata, but these are all fakes, cheap imitations of the 21 Great Swords. Of the original 21 Great Swords, only three still remain. The blade wielded by Ryuma, the ebony blade Shusui, is one of them. The second was wielded by a man called Roronoa Zoro, the demon sword Sandai Kotetsu, this sword is located in the man's grave, Hogback didn't know of the sword's greatness otherwise he would have taken it too when he recovered Shusui. The third is the one I want, and is the most powerful of the 21 great swords, the unknown master's guaranteed masterpiece. A blade of unsurpassed quality and power. This sword is the Dark Blade Zanmuto, and it is located in yet another grave, the grave of its previous wielder who died over 800 years ago. I have recently learned of its location and that is where I am going now. It actually isn't too far, so I should be back before the week is up. So I shall trust you to keep an eye on things while I am gone. If Sabuza shows up before I return, let me know. I will see you when I return Perona-chan and whatever you do, stay unnoticed. Then before she could respond he picked up his bag, leaned over and kissed the girl right on the lips, before vanishing, leaving her in a slight daze. Small unnamed island, the ocean, three days later. Naruto reached the rocky shore and put his hands on his knees, panting. Running across water for three days straight can really take it out of a guy. All he could say was thank God for soldier pills. Naruto recovered himself and examined the terrain. It wasn't a large place, little more than an outcropping of rock with a cave really. The rocks near the shore were sharp and dangerous and the waves crashed hard against them. The place was overall very bleak. He guessed that it was an appropriate place for a grave. 
After all, if it were highly noticeable then people would have found and invaded the place years ago. Naruto traversed the rocky ground carefully, the ground was treacherous and a misstep could lead to something like a twisted ankle and that would really suck. He made it to the narrow cave entrance and passed through, emerging in a decent-sized tunnel. He had barely gone three steps down it when a volley of darts went whizzing through the air towards his face. They were stopped instantly of course, but Naruto really had to be amazed. This guy died over 800 years ago and these traps were guaranteed to be at least that old. The fact that they still worked was nothing less than astounding. Naruto continued through the rocky tunnels, occasionally besieged by various traps which were effortlessly blocked. They ranged from poison darts to three axes that swung out of hidden recesses in the rock at neck, waist, and knee level at the same time. Any normal person would have been long dead by now. The greatest defense of the island was that it actually moved. It never stayed in the same place for more than a few days, it just drifted along the ocean, but the traps were there to stop anyone who managed to find the place from looting the grave that was located here. Before long, Naruto stood at the grave. It was in a single room on its own, a single stone sarcophagus. The lid must have weighed at least 500 pounds. There was a marble slab at the head of the gigantic coffin bearing the name of the deceased person who resided here, but Naruto didn't even glance at it, he already knew who was here. He strode over to the coffin lid and after a moment to set his feet, he put both hands on the lid and heaved. He pushed as hard as he could but after a moment he grunted with the great effort and ceased in his struggling. Naruto took a moment to recover his breath. The thing was heavier than he thought. After a moment, he snapped his fingers and his shadow came to life. He looked at the thing and said, move this, the shadow nodded and pressed itself against the slab of rock. It pushed hard against the stone and after a moment, the rock began to shift and grind to the other side, revealing the interior of the coffin. A few seconds later, the stone slab fell against the ground with a large crack. Naruto smiled and his shadow returned to its normal place at his feet. Nine months of searching, all for this moment, his mouth was watering with anticipation of the sight and power of the legendary blade and maybe more. He looked into the coffin and saw nothing inside but a solid two inches of dust and a large sword. He sifted his hand through the dust. Hmm, I guess even the greatest swordsman of all time could not stand against father time, the old man with the hourglass is patient. Then, he turned his attentions to the sword. It was a gorgeous piece of work, you could feel the power running through its length. It was six feet long, with a one foot long handle. The blade was straight but with a curve near the end. The entire length of the blade was solid black, so dark that it would be invisible in a dark room. The hilt was of solid gold and it was quite large, easily reaching four feet wide, from side to side. If you looked at the sword from the bottom, from the tip of the blade to the handle, it actually looked a lot like a cross. Despite the 800 years of captivity in a stone box, it had lost none of its luster, none of its power, it truly was the greatest of the 21 great swords. Naruto reached into the coffin and tentatively touched the handle of the sword, it was very cold, but he tried to lift it. He struggled with the blade, it was extremely heavy. He could feel the sword rejecting his attempt to wield it. Regardless of that he struggled on to lift the blade and brought it into a guard position. He fed his chakra into the sword, attuning it to his energies, forcing it to accept him as its new master. He felt immense resistance from the blade itself pressing the chakra away and rejecting him as an individual, like a wild horse that refused to be mounted, seeing no human as its master. He continued regardless and he could feel his own power, slowly but surely, overwhelming that of the sword, his chakra pressing against and subduing that aura of power around the blade, it was difficult to press his chakra into such a resilient thing. The sword was almost alive in its own right, and it refused to see someone as its master without a fight, pressing his chakra away and turning its handle red hot in an attempt to force him to let go. The battle of will took hours before a winner was decided. Naruto stood fast constantly, not even thinking of allowing a length of metal to best him, constantly feeding his chakra into the sword, attempting to subdue the blade, while it did all it could to break his grasp of the blade, to break his concentration so that it could free itself. 
Despite the efforts of the black steel, Naruto won out, pouring his chakra into the sword, subduing it, forcing it to see him as its master. As suddenly as it began, the constant pressure against his chakra stopped, the immense heat pouring through the hilt of the blade ceased, becoming a gentle warmth, the weight ceased to be so fearsome, becoming light as a normal kunai, it was official, he had bested the mind of the sword and it saw him as a worthy wielder, a worthy master. Naruto let out a breath, he had been constantly pouring his chakra into the thing for six hours straight. He knew that the obtaining of one of the great swords would not be easy but that was still far more difficult than he had anticipated. He placed the newly submissive sword in the same ceiling area that he had placed his axe in before, in the shadow pressed into his right sleeve. The blade vanished and he went to the entrance of the room, pausing only to look back at the pillaged coffin. He just said four words before departing the tomb, beginning his journey home. Those four words were, thank you, Dracul my hawk. Naruto's camp, Nami no Kuni, three days later. Naruto managed to get back to the camp in roughly the same amount of time that it took him to get to Myhawk's grave. The sword was sealed into his sleeve, and he was fucking exhausted. Perona looked up from the fire and said, Naruto Kuen. I'm so glad you're back. How was the trip? Did you get what you were looking for? Naruto just staggered to the bedroll and mumbled, found sword, tired, need sleep before collapsing onto the portable sleeping apparatus. Perona just smiled and put a blanket over him. Then after a while she snuggled up next to him and fell asleep as well. About 12 hours later, Naruto struggled back to the world of the awake and immediately shut his eyes. It was at least noon and the sun was blinding. He woke up Perona after waking up fully. Hmm, naruto Kuen. What time is it? Perona slowly rose and rubbed the sleep from her eyes. Naruto got up and looked around the campsite. He said, around noon, judging by the sun. So what happened while I was gone? Did Zabuza make his second appearance yet? Perona got up and yawned before replying, no, he's still hiding, though by that Cyclops judgment he should be showing up today. All those four have been doing is training to climb up trees, it was boring as hell. I mean, they took a week to master it. I managed to master it in an hour and that was about 10 minutes after you unlocked my chakra and explained what it was and what I could do with it. How long did it take you? Naruto looked away from the surrounding forest, he was quite paranoid at times. Tree, climbing? Uh, about two hours. So those idiots are that lame, huh? Jeez. If Itachi heard that his brother took a week to master tree climbing he would have a stroke. The rest of the clan is probably rolling in their graves. Well, today the boredom is over Perona-chan, we finally get to have some fun. Perona put out what remained of the fire with a small sweet jutsu before she realized something. Wait, two hours? That means I mastered it faster than you. Naruto smiled a bit before approaching her, yes, you did. You are quite the little genius. He kissed her right on the lips before saying, now come on, it would be best to pack up camp now so that no one finds it later. After today we finally go back home. I need you to check out the bridge and let me know when Zabuza makes his move and more importantly, when Gata shows up. He went and started to pack up the tents, sealing them into scrolls, before returning them to his jacket. Perona just nodded and made her way to the bridge, doing her best to fight off the large blush that had adorned her cheeks. Naruto sat down on a nearby fallen log after packing everything away, taking a short rest. Twelve hours of sleep helped a lot, but he was still pretty tired after running as fast as he could at a dead sprint for about six days straight over water. Over 10,000 miles covered in six days, it really took more out of him than he thought. I'll have to step up my training again. My body needs to be as strong as possible to use those techniques. But I'm a lot closer to that goal than I was. Ten years of extreme taijutsu training is finally showing some real results, but I still can't use them freely. I'll have to work hard to master them before the chunin exams come around, but I think I can do it. No, I know, I can do it. The ultimate style of taijutsu mastered only by a few in all of history. I've said it before but I'll say it again, 
thank God for QB and the Yandame's stupidity. He wasn't sure, but he could feel that QB was rather amused at his little mental speech. He was shook from his musings by a small ghost, no larger than his hand, which floated down from the trees. It stayed in place about two feet in front of him before Perona's voice came through, Naruto Kuen, Zabuza has made his move, he and his apprentice are fighting Kakashi, Sasuke, and Sakura. That other girl, Ten Ten, hasn't shown up yet. Gata hasn't made an appearance, but I'm keeping about 40 eyes out for him. Naruto nodded and the ghost dissipated, Perona's recon abilities weren't nearly as good as Yukino's, but they were still pretty good, more like a dozen invincible Kage Bunshins that constantly transmitted information rather than Yukino's endless army of invisible living cameras. Still very useful for mid or long range though. Naruto got up and got moving to the ghost girl's location. Small cliff overlooking the bridge. Naruto emerged from the forest and looked around. Perona chose a pretty good spot, it was a ridge that had an excellent view of everything around and had a good view of the bridge. He saw that a thick mist had taken up the southern half of the nearly completed bridge. He also saw a dome of mirrors that contained Sasuke. He shook his head in disdain, that boy was truly a disappointment. Perona was sitting nearby with her eyes closed. Forming and maintaining that many ghosts really took a lot of concentration. He left her to her meditation and reconnaissance, she already knew that he was there. He just watched the fight, and paid close attention to the two missing Nin. About 10 minutes later, Perona opened her eyes, I found them. Gatu and the 10 zombies you lent him are currently boarding a boat about 5 miles away, heading toward the bridge. Naruto smiled and said, let's go. Perona nodded and they vanished. About 5 minutes later. Naruto and Perona watched as the boat made its way to the bridge. It wasn't much, a wooden boat meant to carry people from point A to point B, nothing special. Gatu and the 10 zombies were riding it, and one of the zombies was driving the craft. Naruto motioned for Perona to stay where she was before he jumped down. Gatu had been doing great. Ever since that guy showed up years ago, his takeover of Nami had gone without a hitch. He had to be careful not to let anybody see the zombies and live, but it wasn't too hard. Sure the rent was quite large, but it was more than worth it compared to how much money he was making off of the deal. He was just about to go and take care of that naive idiot Zabuza and that bitch of an apprentice of his when a cloaked figure dropped onto the boat from nowhere. The man looked up slightly, but he couldn't make out any features. He just said in an eerily familiar voice, it has been a while Gatu. Who the hell are you? Did you come to try and kill me? Who sent you? Gatu was in a fair bit of panic at the moment, I mean how often does a guy show up out of nowhere like that? Okay, dumb question, how often does that happen for a civilian? The figure placed one hand over its heart before the voice said, Oh Gatu, I'm hurt. You don't remember me? You've only been paying me every month for about four years in exchange for these beauties here. The figure motioned toward the zombies as he did so and as he did, Gata finally recognized him. Oh, it's you. It's been a while hasn't it? Forgive me for my rudeness, but it has been a long time and I didn't recognize you immediately, I'm so sorry. Gata didn't normally behave like this but the last time the man appeared, he made Gata insanely rich and powerful, practically handing him a country and he was eager to find out what he was here to offer this time around. The figure chuckled before saying, Oh, it's no problem Gatu, no problem at all believe me I understand. Now then, as to why I am here, I am here to give you the greatest gift you could imagine. Gata looked up at this and his eyes sparkled as the figure continued, Oh yes, it is the greatest gift anyone could receive. That gift is, freedom from all worldly attack meant. Before Gatu could do anything more than look confused a large black blade appeared in the man's hand and lopped off the businessman's head. He swung the massive blade once to shed the blood from the black steel before it vanished, sealed once more. He muttered to himself, idiot, thinking that a demon would keep you alive once you were no longer useful. Then he looked around and said, you know who I am. The zombies gathered in front of him and knelt at his feet as the boat came to a stop, they said at the same time, yes, master. Naruto smiled before saying, 
Good, then prepare to return home. Your job here is done. He willed the shadows to surround them and the zombies sank into that darkness, returning to Hogback's cave system. He would know what to do with them, this was standard procedure after all. He rifled through Gata's pockets and took his wallet and after removing the money from it, jumped back up to where Perona was watching. He smiled at her and said, let's get back to the bridge, our job here is almost finished. They watched as the battle reached its conclusion, Haku abandoning her fight with Sasuke and the return 1010 and jumping into the way of the Raikiri that would slay her master and Zabuza attacking the tired Kakashi immediately afterwards. The Jutsu used blasting the pair of Kiri ninja into the sea as a small army arrived at the bridge too late to do anything except cheer at the defeat of the Kiri no Oni and escort the ninjas to where they could rest. For them, the day was won. Naruto, on the other hand, sent his shadow to retrieve the corpses. Within a minute it returned bearing the bodies of the man and his apprentice, even brining Zabuza's sword along as well. He laid the bodies out and proceeded to remove the water from the lungs of the pair as he assessed the damage to the two. He had the bodies of two more general zombies on his hands, he wanted to know how much work he and Hogback had to do. He was the most surprised when the girl, Haku, gasped loudly. Holy shit, we have a live one. Naruto cried as he looked over the Hayatan user. The Raikiri missed her heart but nailed her in one of her lungs pretty well. Without some quick treatment she wouldn't last long. He knew that the ice elemental Keke Genkai that she had was unique, that was one of the reasons he wanted her body, it was powerful and he knew that for sure after seeing her in combat. However, it required training and knowledge to use, that was training and studying that the shadow he used to animate the corpse would have to do in order to use the techniques effectively. If he could get her to serve him willingly, he wouldn't have to zombify her and waste time in order to obtain the Hayatan. As a result, he would do his best to make sure she lived. So he used one of the more unknown powers of his shadow. He had the shadow manifest itself and conform to the wounded portion of her body. It would change into the flesh that she had lost, attaching itself to her seamlessly. It would take the form of the ruined lung, allowing her to breathe, taking the shape of the pierced arteries, veins, and ruined flesh, keeping her alive. Not healing her injuries, but replacing what she had lost temporarily. If Naruto wanted he could have it remain that way for the rest of the girl's life and it would have no ill effects, but he wanted the shadow back at some point so it would act as a patch until they got the girl to hog back. He may have been creepy, but he was at least as good as Tsunade when it came to medicine and healing. As Perona watched in awe of her master's hitherto unseen ability, he looked over Zabuza. He got nailed with a Raikiri in the heart and was long gone. After knocking Haku unconscious once more, he beckoned Perona closer and Naruto used the Kage Hoku to travel back to the caves. Hidden Caves, Hokage Monument Interior Naruto arrived in the usual room and yelled out, Hogback. Get your ass in here. We've got two bodies, one general class frame and a live one needing treatment. Within a minute Hogback, Absalom, Haruka, and Yukino had entered the room. He told them, Absalom, bring in the dude with sword to Hogback's lab. This one is going to be a general so he takes priority over any current projects. Hogback, the girl needs treatment, she got nailed in the lung with Kakashi's Raikiri, but I'm keeping her stable. Help me get her to where you need her to perform surgery. Haruka and Yukino, get out of the way. The beast man picked up the deceased demon of the mist and his sword and carried them off while Hogback and Naruto carried in Haku on a stretcher made of darkness. Two hours later. Naruto walked out of the medical room with a bloody mask and smock which he removed. Hogback was taking care of some last details, such as the bandaging and sleeping drugs, to keep her zonked out for a while. The surgery had been a success and Haku, while guaranteed to be sore and weak for a while, was going to be okay with a new lung and replaced flesh. He had ordered the group to take care of the ice girl until he got a chance to talk to her which wouldn't be for a while. After getting everything together, he called to Perona and they went back to the house. They had had quite a day, so Naruto decided to call it a night, and Perona did too soon after. Naruto had roughly a month until the Chunin exams, and he had some techniques to master before then, a lot of training to be done and a new general zombie to prepare. 
Thanks for watching, I hope you guys enjoyed, if you did, comment down below and let me know. Also share this video with your friends. I have created a playlist of this what if where you guys can find all the parts. See you in the next video.